One of the responsibilities of men here is to protect the tribe. Oh, thank you. It's looking juicy. Who are you protecting this tribe from? They protect the community from upper sides of the mountain here, Mago. They came to their village and they took hundreds of cows from them. That was the main reason for the conflict. And so how do you retaliate? I mean, is it ever the case that people die in these conflicts? Among Africa's 54 countries, one nation stands alone. Welcome to Ethiopia. When it comes to history, Ethiopia has a story to tell. It's the only African country to never have been colonized. Okay. He's got a lot of those. It's a nation that dances to its own beat. We are in the biggest open market in Africa. Holy cow. What's happening? Where time seems to bounce to its own rhythm. This place is wild. I feel like I've just stepped into another planet. A simmering cauldron of cultures with over 90 ethnic groups. Are you ever worried about your house burning down? Because this looks very flammable. And then there's the food. Ethiopian food is some of the most distinct, different, and delicious on the continent. Wow. And here, in Ethiopia's buzzing capital of Addis Ababa, you can find it all. Starting with their iconic injera bread. Wow, it smells sour. <laughs> Any good Ethiopian dish starts with this. Injera bread is sour and stretchy. Scoop it up. And waiting to be wrapped around your next bite. One of the reasons we eat like this is we feed each other. Do you want some egg? <laughs> Skilled hands season stews with berbere, a potent Ethiopian spice blend, marked by its distinct glowing orange hue. These stews are often made without meat, as people here abstain from meat for over half the year. Sometimes people also observe avoiding alcohol during fasting season. <laughs> That's not that fun. But when the time to eat meat comes, no one goes harder than Ethiopia. You can see a whole slab of cow just hanging right here, and the folks here taking big chunks off of it. Consuming piles of beef served raw. You seem like you do that a lot. Addis Ababa is where my journey begins, but I'm on a mission to break out of the capital and delve deep into Ethiopia's Omo Valley, a place that's called home by many of Ethiopia's tribes. Tribes with ancient cooking customs and techniques that go back centuries. So he's the chief of 650 people. Yeah. I'm only the chief of about 18 people. There are the Dorze, a highland tribe who receives clothing, housing, and food, all thanks to one miracle plant. Is that what you do? The false banana tree. When I look at this, I wouldn't think that this could turn into this right here. But when they're not eating plants, they're eating beef. And here, every part of the cow is eaten raw. As I'm looking at it, I still can see some of the food that was in the cow's stomach. Yeah, that's food of them. Of the cow. Of the cow. And now it's our food. Next, there's the Homer tribe. He's gonna jump now. Where men jump over cattle to prove their manhood. So he's cutting off a piece of the brain right here, and he's gonna go for it. And women cake their hair with red clay. Do you own a mirror? I like that. How do you know if your hair looks the way you want it to look? The Dasanach tribe lives near the fertile Omo River. Here, they catch fish. The preparation here is very straightforward. And sometimes, in the dark of night, they hunt for black crocodiles. Right now, it's chaos on the beach. There's about 100 people watching us. Their plan is to go out for the rest of the night and go until they get a crocodile. Is it gonna happen? I guess we'll find out tomorrow morning. The Mercy Tribe stands apart with their unique lip plates, worn by the women for reasons we'll soon discover. How did it change your everyday life? Here, they mill sorghum and boil greens. Look, just follow them. But on special occasions, they solder a cow. And no single portion of protein goes to waste. When you go into a barn full of manure, and usually you would smell it, that experience is happening instead in my mouth. Yes, of course. So when people are like, oh, it tastes like sh Oh, how do you know what sh tastes like? Have you tasted sh Yes. Like their famous Burberry seasoning, Ethiopia is a medley of flavor. They don't do this at Starbucks at all. A mosaic of cultures. How does one learn to barbecue like this? Like, 
Every spice, every ethnic group adds a note to this cultural symphony. Here, I like that we have these kind of uh, hair picks. It's also a land of extremes, of vegans and carnivores, where virtuosos of flavor create magic with spices. It's hard to describe that kind of flavor. But also, where food is eaten in its most pure form. When I was broke, I got to eat sushi once a year, and I loved it. And this is a little bit like raw salmon in texture. Love it. Our Ethiopian food journey begins here, in its capital of Addis Ababa. I'm on a mission to see what makes Ethiopian street food unlike any other country in Africa. This place is very busy. And you've just got vats and vats full of dough, fermenting flour. This is like the base of most or many meals here in Ethiopia. What is the name of this bread? Injera. I know what you're thinking. Sunny, it's just a pancake. But no, this is no ordinary sheet of carb-heavy bread. Injera has secrets that have made it the foundation of almost every dish throughout Ethiopia. And here, at Abaine's five-year-old bread bakery, Good day. Yeah. <laughs> some of the most delectable injera in the city is being crafted. Perfect. It's all about the batter. Here, it's made with maize and teff flour, an ancient cereal grain that's been cultivated in Ethiopia for thousands of years. What is the secret behind making the perfect injera? You have to know the right amount of mixture. First, mix the teff flour with water and ferment it for one day. Add some maize to the mix and let the batter ferment even more. Why do you want it to be fermented? It gives it that sour kick. That's a taste that people like here? So definitely. Measuring by can, splashes of that grainy goodness land on the sizzling hot griddle, resulting in an Ethiopian cultural symbol. This is like a big, beautiful, sticky sheet. I love the texture on here because one side is smooth, then the other side is bubbly. <sighs> it smells sour. Can I rip off a piece? Would you like some? Please. Okay. Joining me, Mahi, a local content creator and a food enthusiast living in Addis Ababa, a city with a population of over 5 million and a blend of modern buildings and infrastructure pushed up against outdoor markets that go back centuries. I can't make a good injera like this. Mine would have like holes everywhere. Is it okay just to eat it plain? Mmm. Sour, right? Sour, but it's not just about the flavor. It has a nice elasticity to it. It's kind of stretchy, a bit of a chewiness to it. Then the flavor just has some real punch. Oh, this guy. <laughs> He's like, this interview is going on way too long. <laughs> you busy? Check it, Bitcoin. In one day, how many times are you personally eating in Jira? Three, four, five. Really? I cannot personally go a day without it. In Jira. It's not just food, it's the implement, an edible utensil used to scoop up every last drop of deliciousness Ethiopia has to offer. Hearty stews, vibrant veggies, tantalizing sauces, or even this dish. I just don't know, what are the effects of eating so much raw meat? Which we'll be trying Cheers. very soon. But first, taking center stage is the crown jewel of Ethiopian cuisine, the national dish Dora Wat. Transcending time and tradition with a symphony of spices, tender chicken, and rich sauce, the dish is best served fresh, and it doesn't get fresher than this. Holy cow! What's happening? I don't know if we picked the best place for an interview. Okay. This place is wild. Where are we right now? We are in Mercato, the biggest, largest open market in Africa. We're gonna buy chicken for Dora Wat. <laughs> Stretching over several square miles in the heart of Addis Ababa, this market is a hub of commercial activity, trade, and cultural exchange. How often do you come to this market personally? If I want to buy something in bulk, it's cheaper here, and you can literally find anything here. What about the new iPhone? The smells in this market, especially where we are right now, there is such an aroma of mixed spices. Is this a country that really loves spices? Yes. Every plate that we have has many spices in it. The one spice that's almost in every dish is berberi. And it's a combo of different spices. But the baseline is chili powder. Dorot is very spicy. Are you ready for that? <laughs> Hidden within the bustling labyrinth of the Mercado Market, a humble food vendor about to whip up this country's national dish. In Ethiopia, instead of tediously plucking chicken feathers, the feathers and the skin are ripped off in one fell swoop. Then the meat is hacked up and soaked in a treatment of salty lemon juice. Next, the sauce. Saute onion with cooking oil. Then add the master spice of any good Ethiopian dish, berberet. Then water, garlic and onion salt. Finally, add the meat, 
clarified butter, and hard-boiled eggs for even more protein. Let it simmer for six hours to achieve the rich and complex flavors that make it famous. Since Dorawat is a labor of love and a practice of patience, it's most often made in homes for special occasions. So food stall over Yide Nakachu has prepared this dish just for us. There's a lot here. There's the chicken, there's the eggs, there's the injera, and then this kind of stew all around it. Do you know how to eat? How to eat? No. Should I show you? Yes. Okay. This yes. is your like fork or spoon. Scoop Good. it up. You can Good add up. the eggs or the meat if you want to. This is a type of food, if you put it in your Tupperware container, it's gonna be stained orange Definitely. forever. Definitely. All right, so you don't want it too much on your fingers. Mm. Wow, the spice is nothing but cake. It's an extreme flavor. And this is coming from the Berberet, right? Exactly. To me, it seems like Berberet is to Ethiopia what masala is to India. Yeah. How many different spices are inside of it? More than 10. More than 12. So. 13. <laughs> 12 is in a ridiculous number. There are black seed, garlic, ginger, cumin, to name a few. Turmeric? Not really. No. I don't taste turmeric. Erase no. that. It tastes chili powder? Yeah. A lot of chili powder. We got some chicken here. Mm. Oh my god. The chicken is really tender, very heavy, very oily. It's like it's got personality, it's got flavor, it's got some edge to it. I'm in love with this. Mm. I forgot to mention. So one of the reasons we eat like this is we feed each other. I'm gonna show you what we do when we eat together. This is called Gersha. So you met this guy today? Yeah. And that's normal? Yeah. Meals in Ethiopia are often served on a communal platter. Food is shared among family and friends. Do you want some egg? <laughs> and the gesture of actually physically feeding someone is an act of affection <laughs> you shy? and respect. Can men feed men? When you're eating together, it's fine. It's a ritual of bonding, a celebration of togetherness. I noticed nobody's trying to feed me. And I, right now, oh. I'm definitely feeling the bond. Very polite. How long have you had a shop here? One year. Your shop is located right next to this very peculiar, distinct alley. About every 10 seconds, there's a man walking through here with a sack of coffee beans that weighs 220 pounds. That's more than me. Meanwhile, you have women lining the alleyway here. What are these women working on? The world's most socially acceptable addiction can trace its heritage back centuries to the ancient coffee forests of the Ethiopian plateau. Those are coffee beans that come from the farm. The women, they pick out the bad one. After this process, they get to grade it, and then it goes to sell. Here, it's all about high-quality Arabica, consumed domestically and exported all over the world. I know around the world that Ethiopian coffee is really iconic, but how is it perceived here in Ethiopia? It's a very big deal in Ethiopia. We get to have it maybe two, three times a day. Is Ethiopian coffee strong? It's very strong. But coffee here isn't just about flavor or a caffeine kick. It's about the experience. I love coffee very much. That's why I open the shop and every day I prepare nice coffee. I serve people. Oh, wow. Very nice mood. <laughs> Thank <Yeah>. you. <laughs> Welcome to Teru's Coffee Shop. Right now, she's executing a centuries-old traditional coffee ceremony called Buna. Do you smell that? It smells like popcorn. That could be this over here, though. Mm, yeah. There's the roasting. So this happens. Thank you. Are you cleansing yourself? What's happening no. exactly? So you're smelling the coffee. They don't do this at Starbucks at all. Exactly. There's the grinding. Your pestle is basically a giant piece of rebar. Some so of them are made of wood, and some of them are like that. Yeah, some of them come from like a collapsed bridge. <laughs> and the brewing. The performance demands full presence, urging participants to appreciate each step with great care and attention to detail. That's like 15 scoops. Don't you like your coffee strong and dark? That's gonna be really strong. <laughs> Do you want sugar or no? I'm just gonna go black. I wanna see what the coffee really oh. tastes like. What is this one right here? This is raw. Well, these are basically herbs. Huh, it's fresh, it's like a little bit fruity or citrusy. Put it in your coffee, just mix, mix it, it up. up. Oh, I love that. And that's gonna give it flavor? Oh, of course. Do you smell mm, it? Yeah? yeah. Really fragrant. Yeah. Showing? Yeah. <laughs> I got a buzz. Yup. That's what I'm saying. Woo! I taste the rule a little bit. It's fragrant. The coffee is black. It's powerful, but it's still really smooth. Ethiopian coffee is like world famous, and I can see why. Thank you. How far back does coffee go in Ethiopia? I don't know the year, but I know the story of Kaldi. Kaldi discovered coffee. He was herding his goats, and one of his goats went and ate the coffee, and he became very hyper. So Kaldi was very curious, what did he just eat? So he tried it, and he was hyper, and that's how it was discovered. It all started here. Mm -hmm. Coffee is an amazing drug because it said that the world wouldn't be even half as productive if coffee didn't exist. And half as beautiful, I would say. And half as beautiful, <laughs> yeah.
Soon, we'll see how a whole raw animal carcass becomes one of this country's most unique food experiences. Are these guys chefs or are they just butchers? But first, <laughs> once you've checked off Dorawat and coffee, you can't leave Ethiopia without trying this at least a dozen times. We've come to Hannah Maje restaurant for this. This one is Bayanatu. It usually ranges from six items or sometimes even to 30. Bayanatu is a traditional, vibrant Ethiopian platter structured with injera as the base then topped with an assortment of various colorful spiced up vegetables and stews. It's designed to be meat free, yet it feels like nothing's missing. So everything here is vegetarian? Vegan. Vegan? Yes. But Yainatu is usually eaten during fasting season. Are you someone who participates in the fasting? Um. <laughs> uh, uh. Joining me for the second half of today's street food tour, Ada, an enthusiastic food lover who showcases the wonders of Ethiopian cuisine through her platform. We have two breads. We have a middle bread and an outer bread. Which bread should I use? You can go for any bread. I think I'm overthinking. <laughs> What are we looking at here? This is called misir, a stew made with saute onion, Burberry seasoning, red lentils, garlic, and vegan nidder kiba, or Ethiopian plant-based spiced butter. I like to combine a spicy dish with a vegetable. Is it spinach? Collard greens. greens. Collard greens. Cheers. Mmm. Oh, that's fantastic. The greens give it some texture and so much flavor. It has a simple spicy tomato flavor, but then there's a deep savoriness underneath. Oh, that's fantastic. With the lentils that are in here, it gives some texture too, so it almost feels like you could be eating ground beef or something like that. It doesn't feel like something's missing. Absolutely. We have so many stews on the injera bread, but we have this on this side. Why is that? Because oh, that's the start of the show. This is shiro, and here's how it's made. Saute onion and garlic in hot oil. Then add water and chickpea powder and cook until it thickens up. Add onion salt, kiva, and bell pepper. Finally, serve it hot in a clay pot. Oh yeah, look at that texture. It's like a melted gas station cheese. <laughs> Toss it back. Mmm, wow. Unbelievable. Incredibly creamy, savory, and it almost has a shrimp-like flavor to it. Did they put shrimp in there on accident? No. <laughs> Oh, it's so good. I think what could influence the flavor is actually the pot itself. To me, it's uh, unbelievable that there's no butter inside because it tastes buttery and it just has like a little bit of seafood essence that I'm dreaming That's of. That's why they call Ethiopian food vegan heaven. The idea of vegan food, has that been going on for generations, for hundreds of years? Oh, absolutely. Over 60% of Ethiopia is Orthodox Tewahedo Christian, who practice fasting more than 210 days per year, up to a whopping 55 days at a time. But to fast here doesn't mean to abstain from food completely. Fasting meaning abstaining from all animal products. Absolutely. And sometimes people also avoiding alcohol during fasting season. <laughs> That's not that fun. But when the time for fasting is over, Folks here approach meat with an equal and opposite intensity. Can you tell me where we are? I don't know what's happening. Because I see meat here, and then I see platters here, and then it just goes out. And I don't see any like Korean barbecue grills. People are eating raw meat here, aren't they? Yes, absolutely. We've just arrived at Yoma Butcher. Sir? Put her there. A four decade old restaurant relentlessly focused on one thing. First of all, can I say, nice rack. Your meat rack, it's nice. Right here, this one. Are you only serving beef raw? Uh, yeah, but it, yeah, but it. He's saying it's our house specialty, but there are other places where you can also get goat meat or sheep meat. The meat's looking pretty fresh. Could you slice this off a piece? In this tradition, the butcher becomes the chef. So he's slicing off what I would consider to be not a small piece. Selecting the freshest cuts of meat from the animal carcass and serving up platefuls to a crowd. So right here we have the cubed raw beef. Now, there's nothing that unusual about raw beef. I mean, steak tartare, it's famous all over the world. In Japan, they have raw beef nigiri on the rice. Here, the biggest difference is this kind of presentation. The fact that you can see a whole slab of cow just hanging right here and the folks here taking big chunks off of it. But this looks fantastic. Cheers. <laughs> Hmm. Not too tough, a bit tender, lean, but a little bit of fat residue. Overall, enjoyable. What do you think? It's my first time. You are? Uh, you've never eaten this? Mm -mm. Does it taste similar to anything else you've had before? No. Would you do it again? Maybe. Okay, right there. <laughs> well, you can't ever reveal your weakness to me. Cheers. <laughs>
If slabs of raw beef sashimi aren't your thing, maybe you'd prefer an Ethiopian beef tartare. This is called kitfo. The aim is to achieve a smooth, even, gushy texture. Is there a certain cut that people prefer above any other cut? This part, right below the hump. First, fresh beef is minced. Then add jalapeno, onion, and mint minta, a local spice blend. Add a touch of olive oil and mix it well. This looks like meat heaven. Absolutely. It looks fantastic. I cannot believe it. There is a lot of raw meat right here. I don't think we should start with that. Okay. Next to the raw meat, cooked meat. Yes. Something you call tibs? Yes, it means fried. Tibs, a savory stir fry, showcasing tender pieces of lamb or beef. The meat is flash fried in hot oil before being sauteed with onions, garlic, and jalapeno. Serve a top in jura, then it's ready to tantalize your taste buds. Is this any certain part of the cow? Usually the round beef is really good for it. Oops. Oh my god, this is like to die for. It's rich, it's slightly chewy, slightly tender, and 100% delicious. Yes. The onions make such a big difference because they are slightly caramelized and sweet. On the side here, we have some different sauces. This is really spicy. I think I can handle it. Okay. Is that too much? Um, Don't care. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Tolerable. I like it. The part that's throwing me off is that there's a ridiculous amount of raw meat. How many people <laughs> would this feed? It's so much meat. This could feed three people. Why is raw meat such a prevalent thing in this country? It's a delicacy here in Ethiopia. As much as there is vegan food, the meat-eating culture here is also very huge. Wow, look at this dainty little piece you gave me. <laughs> it's so small. You want a big one? No, okay. I don't. I'm gonna give it a little bit of a dip in the mustard. Oh, wow. That mustard has like a little bit of horseradish or something in there. It almost feels like a hit of wasabi. For a moment, I felt like I was eating Japanese food. <laughs> so here we have kind of like a steak tartare with spices inside. I oh. recommend the injera ah, for this. yes. <laughs> So treat it like a stew. Cheers. Cold, which is a good sign. Mm -hmm. You don't want it to be like warm. You want the fats leaking out. Mm -hmm. You can taste the garlic and the jalapeno. It's got some spice to it. A little bit oily in a good way. Overall, I like it. Is the meat gonna give me worms? Possibly, which is why traditionally, after having a variety of raw meat, we usually follow it up with a traditional drink called arake. This is an Ethiopian version of vodka, if you will. Oh, this smells really strong. All right, cheers to killing the worms inside of us. <laughs> cheers, <Both>. yes. Yeah. <sighs> Better than vodka, right? Yeah, I feel very warm <laughs> right here. I feel like I could put that in my gas tank if I ran out of fuel. <laughs> This country is not a monoculture. There are so many different tribes, and groups, ethnicities, people from different backgrounds, people with different recipes and traditions. So how does all that factor into what is known as Ethiopian food? That's a good question. Ethiopian food is very diverse and offers more than injera. And there are even parts of Ethiopia that do not consume injera. So what you see here and what represents Ethiopia doesn't even scratch the surface to what they Ethiopian cuisine offers. My team's only spending a couple days in Addis Ababa. Right after this, we're flying south and we're going into the Omo Valley where we're gonna film several videos with the local indigenous tribes. Wow. Do you have any advice for me? I would say embrace the culture because it's quite different. So be open-minded. Oh. So everything I've seen here in Addis Ababa, when I go there, is it just gonna be completely different? Brace yourself. So he's cutting open the bile sac now. I think he'll just put a few drops on there, I'm hoping. We left Ethiopia's capital of Addis Ababa and arrived in the Gamo Highlands with an elevation of over 8,500 feet. Here, the unique geography and available plant species dictate the distinct Dorze diet. I've seen a lot of animals slaughtered in a lot of African villages and it's always completely unpredictable. From cattle, all the way to this region's most life-giving plant, known as the false banana. And it's our main dish and it's a backbone for Dorze tribe. Now, I'm on a mission to live life as a Dorze tribe member, touring their fascinating homes. The cows actually reside within the home. Why do you keep the cows in the house? And sharing in their meals. That's so much boil. No matter how challenging they may be. This is gonna be the most smelly, like powerful organ in the animal. I'm so happy to be here. How do you feel? We are very happy too. 
guiding me through this day of eating, Kuru, son of the village chief who sits beside him. Next to me, his mother, the cook who crafted this common morning meal. Right here we have a tremendous breakfast. It looks like a big tortilla. Would you call this bread? This we call it cocho. And this is made from something called false banana. Yeah. This is the false banana tree, and this is no ordinary plant. This tree can feed cattle. It can create clothing for people. It can build houses 20 feet high. And it can feed hungry bellies. But stealing calories from this false banana tree isn't as easy as, well, picking a banana. Here's how it works. You can use the stalk or the trunk of the tree, which is what this is. Peel this part off. Do we do anything with this? This will be food for the cutters. With the false banana trunk firmly affixed to a wooden plank, our cook employs a rolling pin to grind the inner contents. It's like these amazing cell walls that have big gaps in between. This is what you eat? Yeah. This is when we scratch it, the culture is from. When they shave it, there is a strong fiber. So that's fiber, that's the leftover. We use it to make ropes, sacks, traditional hats. Next, she extracts the liquid from the starchy matter and gives it a mint. From here, you have to wait at least three months to eat it, ensuring that it reaches the perfect state of fermentation. After treatment, when you put it longer, the longer is better. How many months do you prefer to have it fermented? She doesn't speak English. I know, but that's why you translate for me. <laughs> yeah. Because you speak English. Yeah. It's more than a year. That is quite an investment, and it doesn't even get you drunk. Today, we break our fast with an eight-month fermented false banana pancake. The fermented pulp is hydrated with fresh water, then kneaded into a dough. She flattens the dough, then cooks it over a raging hot steel pan. It's like a thick wheat tortilla. Mm. It's like a less sweet version of fruit by the foot. Oh, it tastes like dried apple, but with a completely different texture. This bread is either dipped in a fresh honey or a hot chili sauce. I'm gonna go with the honey first. You can definitely tell that's a local honey. It's almost coarse, it's very sugary. The longer we sit here, the more the local bees are figuring out that their honey is right here. They're swarming around us now. So I'm gonna put this in the chili. The spice is made out of chili pepper, garlic, black cumin, and a little amount of ginger on it. It's a good combination, but this is a bit hot for you. Oh, you think I can't handle it? You can try. Okay. <laughs> Oh my God. Yeah. That was a mistake. The chilies here have a very bold, almost bitter flavor to them. Holy cow. Ooh, you have some intense chilies here. The Dorsey population stands today at only about 30,000. Kuru's village is a close-knit community of 70 families. Here in this village, we are 650 people. I know you cultivate food, but you also have some animals too. All right. We eat uh, chicken, goats, sheep. To express my appreciation for the village's hospitality, I've offered them a revered animal, traditionally reserved only for ceremonies. <laughs> We will slaughter a cow. You've collected the blood. This man here is like washing it with leaves. What is the purpose of this? And unite the community in a joyous feast. This one's awesome. Can I have this recipe? This all sounds great on paper. Then Kuru told me this. We eat raw. What are the parts that are eaten raw? The stomach, the heart, and the liver, and also that is a pie. Okay. The slaughtering process has begun. I've seen a lot of animals slaughtered in a lot of African villages. The process can change so much from place to place. It can vary from slashing the neck to suffocating the animal. So right now they're tying up the back legs. Most likely they're gonna tip it over and then that's gonna give them some leverage to move on the cow. <laughs> The best part about the slaughter is there's always some village elder telling the younger guys they're doing it wrong. That's what's happening right now. Once they have leverage on the cow, they can pull its head back, exposing its neck, and then that's that. They cut half the neck and they realize they don't have a bowl for the blood. Never a boring day in the office. Typically, beef is only consumed here during the Christian holidays of Mezcal and Christmas, meaning 
this is a very special occasion. The preparation starts with the most perishable parts. You've collected the blood. This man here is like washing it. What is the purpose of this? When you put it longer, it will be attached to each other. When we cook it, it will be one piece. Are these special plants that you're using? This is a false banana leaf. Oh, that's a false banana yeah. leaf. It's also an anticoagulant, it turns out. Under the skilled hands of the Dorze ladies, the cow blood will soon transform beyond recognition and join our menu. This dish literally contains blood, sweat, and my tears. On the other hand, the liver requires almost no preparation at all. All right, so he's cutting off a big chunk and cutting that into smaller, more manageable chunks. You know, in our culture, first the king starts to eat, so we will wait for him. Yeah. So I'm not in a rush, actually. I just love it. He just eats it like it's nothing, no big deal. You know, I used to think this was really strange, and now I just think it's a little bit strange. Yeah, I've grown over time. Should I stop talking? Just eat, right? Yeah. Okay. Hmm. It's soft. You can literally feel the tissue breaking apart on your teeth as you chew through it. That's the most unique part. The taste is very irony. It's cooled down. Sometimes if you eat it really quickly, you can still feel the warmth of the animal. That can be disconcerting. I could see how this could be a treat out here because this is something you have the opportunity to eat like once a year. Like when I was broke, I got to eat sushi once a year. And this is a little bit like raw salmon in texture. Let's finish this. This is left. Oh, that's so kind, man. Does the king want it though? The liver was just a warm up. Now we're sitting down to a true raw meat feast with the chief and Kuru's sister. On here we have meat. That's something I already experienced in Addis Ababa. They're eating the raw meat like this. But we also have heart, we have kidneys, and we have the stomach. I still can see some of the food that was in the cow's stomach. And now it's our food. Yeah. Yeah. These will soon be eaten with a local dipping sauce they claim is twice as good as ranch. This Dorze hot sauce was made just a moment ago, but it's not complete yet. It needs to have some of this right here. This is the bile sack full of bitter green bile. You're gonna mix some of this into our hot sauce, is that right? Yeah. So he's cutting open the bile sack now. I think he'll just put a few drops on there, I'm hoping. That's a shitload. I think we should start with the kidney. Kidney, heart, then stomach last. I like that you cut these into tiny pieces. That's really helpful for me. Oh, the bile is sitting right on top of this hot sauce. Throw it back. Can we use the bread from the first banana? Sure, where's the bread? I would literally eat anything right now to help with that taste. That is wild. Now, I love the spice. I love the hot sauce. It's very spicy. It's got a powerful kick, but the bile is so bitter. So you know, the bile is good for headache. But that's tough. You only kill the cow once or twice a year. <laughs> so if it's like, hey, I have a headache, just wait three months. Yeah. So you're slicing through the heart. This is my first time having raw beef heart. This thing is pretty massive. The bile is terrifying, but tantalizing at the same time. It's like a car crash. It's like I look at it, but I can't look away. Mm. It's a bit tester for me. The heart feels a little bit softer than everything else so far. I can't say I would eat this every Tuesday, but I'm coming around. There's so much meat here. There's so much food. Could you eat all this raw meat for one meal? Could you fill your stomach just on this? Oh, this is for many people. Share it with everybody. Yeah. I can get down with that. I think we should move on to this right here. That's a big stomach. You know, I used to weigh 136 kilograms. My stomach used to look like that. The texture of this stomach, it looks like a bathroom rug. There's a section from the outside of the stomach, so you peel that part out. Yeah, this is a very fat one. Wow, this is wild. The stomach is very thick, much thicker than I expected. It's really gamey, so it has kind of a bile slash manure type smell to it. Even when we cook it, the smell will be more bad from this. Well, you're quite the salesman. The smell is bad, but don't worry, good when we cook it, it'll be worse. It's really tough. It's like trying to bite through cartilage or something. Oh, and it's... Sorry, it's just... Yeah, it's really intense. Every bite I take, the stomach acids are gushing out of the stomach. And so if it was cooked or maybe washed a bit more, <clears throat> it might be different. I like this guy right here, just chilling. He seems to love it. I love it more than me, this one. It's a good for our health. So mostly you care about the health. Yeah. It's like taking cough medicine. It's not supposed to taste good. It's supposed to make you feel better. When do I start feeling better? After 12 hours. Okay, and I only had one bite. Is that enough to feel better? You can eat it more. Yeah, that's good. 
So this is how the food tastes raw, but soon we'll see what happens when they add a little heat. We are outside and cooking is underway. Right now we're making an iconic dish known as shucha cha cha. It starts with oil and then they're gonna put in some onion right here. Now I know what you're thinking. Earlier, we had that blood that was massaged with herbs so it wouldn't coagulate. You're wondering, hey, what'd they ever do with that blood? Well, it's gonna be used pretty darn soon. Here we go, all at once, hitting the onions, hitting the hot oil. I'm curious to see what happens when you take this liquefied blood and mix it with oil. Is it gonna harden? Is it gonna become crumbly? We're finding out right now in real time. I know the smoke, right? Is it? Yeah, for me too. I was actually getting nostalgic because I had something similar in Zimbabwe. Smoke is the mix for the That's fantastic. I'm supposed to have tears, right? Oh, that's so painful. While gasping for air amidst the smoky chaos, I can't wrap my head around how the same cooking process occurs indoors. Right now, we're inside a traditional Dorze house, a house unlike any I've seen before. This is kind of a communal area. Yeah, the living room. Is this where most of the cooking takes place? When the rain is rain, we cook in the house, if, which is not rain season, we cook outside. With bamboo walls and false banana leaf roofs, the Dorze houses mimic the look of the mighty elephant. <laughs> Inside, bedrooms skirt the edge, encircling the cooking area. This entire structure is strengthened by the constant flow of swirling smoke, standing strong for up to 80 years. As night falls and the fire dies out, the residents seek another source of heat, the cattle. Behind me, this is the cow's quarters. How many cattle do you have in your house? Here's the three cattles. That's when you go to another house. The place is good enough for more than five, six cows. By tucking a barn inside their home, the Dorsey people rely on the warm breath of their cows, warming the house through the chilly nights. Is it true that cows sleep standing up? They stand up. I'm gonna give that a try tonight because I lay down, didn't help. Now back to the outdoor kitchen. Our walk of blood has thickened into a blood crumble, ready for some new ingredients. Right here we have intestines that have already been boiled. Oh, nothing better with blood than minced intestine. Whoa, I thought that was it, we're not done yet. Look, another ingredient. This looks like coarse salt. I gotta say, so far my favorite thing about this dish is that it's cooked. Impressive. With a generous cascade of beef butter, our first cooked protein of the day is ready to be devoured. Two village elders join us for a delightful taste of this mysterious mash. So this is injera bread. Yeah. When I was in the city, it was topped with much different ingredients. But here we've got the blood crumble, we have the intestine. Please, show the way. And now you can take it. A piece. So grab some injera bread, scoop up some blood, scoop up some intestines, throw it back. See the, the happiness wash over her face? <laughs> it's fantastic. I actually think this is gonna be good. This is a test you also from the stomach. Mm, the bread is very sour and the blood is a bit meaty. There's some kind of flavor in there that tastes like fermented cheese. I don't know what that is. Maybe it's just the combination of the injera and the blood together, but that's fascinating. Now I'm gonna scoop up some of the intestine. This is an irresponsible amount right here, but I'm going for it. I don't know why it tastes cheesy. It's like the flavor is familiar, but the way we got there is something I've never seen before. God, it has such a unique flavor, unique texture. I think I like it. How do you say yummy in your language? Males. Oh, <laughs> males? This is such a fascinating country because, you know, Addis Ababa is a booming city. It's becoming more and more modern, buildings sprouting up right and left, and then you go not that far from the city and you're out here, one of the most beautiful places I've seen in Africa. Nay in the world. And this village feels very traditional. It feels very much like it might have seemed or felt long ago. I'm curious, for you two women especially, how has life changed here from the time you were a child until now? You know, the people, they don't send their school, their kids. They stay in their home, they stay in their field. But now the children, they go to their school. And there was no electricity. There's no wild animal ski. And now they wear the traditional clothes. In ancient times, the people, they walk far away. Because now they use it as a transport. Now the males cook, but before it was not allowed to arrive even to the kitchen. I feel like that's so oppressive towards men. <laughs> but now finally men have been given the equal freedom to cook. For generations, the Dorsey livelihood has depended on their exceptional farming and weaving skills. But these days, it's a lot more dependent on these tourists stopping by at all hours of the day to roam the village and tour the houses. 
But what do locals think about being part of a living museum? Do you wish you could go back to the old way where people just left you alone? I'll find out soon. But first, there's a feast to prepare. So we are back in the kitchen right now with the most iconic food of this village. This is the false banana stock right here. And this is going to be part of our soup or our stew. She's slicing it very thin right now. And I'm told you can actually eat it just like this while it's raw. Quick, quick, quick. Um, can I grab some of this? And can I share some with you here? And she doesn't know what's happening. And wait, wait, no, no, we're going to eat it. It feels a little bit like celery. It tastes like a radish that has no spice. Horseradish minus one horse. Interesting. Oh, please continue. Ichi, ichi. I speak a little bit of the local tribal language. It's not a big deal. This is the making of amicho. The recipe couldn't be more straightforward. Potatoes chopped in halves and tossed into a cooking base. False banana roots, or amicho, strut their stuff alongside. Finally, thin sliced false banana trunk and Ethiopian kale interlaced with beef fill up the vessel. This looks amazing. Look at all this food. With the food ready and the table set, the entire village gathers for the much awaited feast. What is this part right here? This is the root part. You can take a piece, one of it. Please, if you want to eat. Mide, mide. Please, mide, mide. Mide. <laughs> please, please enjoy it. Oh, it's so different. This is very starchy. It reminds me kind of of a yam, but a very neutral flavor, almost no flavor. So compared to the bile and the raw organs, this is almost nothing. So this one I saw them making in the house and I saw her chopping up the stock. Oh, that's fantastic. It is like an unusual type of mashed potato with spinach mixed in that's very spicy and a lot of cumin flavor. Yeah. I really like it. I did not expect this at all today. It's something so new. I've never had anything like this anywhere else in Africa. Can I open an Ethiopian restaurant in the USA? Yeah, we have a little false banana. We have a, I'll need a lot of false banana, probably yeah. all that are in the USA. <laughs> yeah. This is Kikir. The preparation of this meat pile requires the force of a cooking army. It starts with mountains of chopped meat and onions. The onion hits the pot first with a generous sprinkle of turmeric powder. Next, chunks of succulent cow meat and bones. Finally, piles of finely chopped beef complete the savory blend. Is there another rib for backup? It's for the camera. Trust me, I'm not selfish. Okay. <laughs> She's like, I, I saw that. Beef ribs, Dorze style. Yeah. Okay. It's been brazen for a bit. A little bit chewy and a much more subtle flavor. It's much more about the beef flavor coming out. Yeah. It's salty, a bit of turmeric, but that's it. How is it? How do you like it? It's very tasty. I like it, she said. You know, I want to ask a little bit more about this village. I noticed that these days, sometimes you have tourists stopping by the village. How old were you when tourists first started coming to this village? When he was 45 years, we saw the tourists where they was in the car. But they don't meet with the tourists. 53 something, they start to visit the village. Mm -hmm. And these days, you have tourists coming by several times a day. And so, do you see it as this lifeline, this way to make money for the community? Or do you wish you could go back to the old way where people just left you alone? No, but I'm there alone. Now it's better. Any people, they like it when there's tourists coming because this is a business for them. Selling clothing and yeah, stuff they like sell, that. Yeah, the people, they change their life. When they get some money from the tourists, they build their house and they change their clothes. That's better for them. Well, listen, I want to say thank you so much for allowing us also into your community and for me to be able to see a different way of life, a new tribe, new people, and it was absolutely a treasure. So thank you so much. You're welcome. Today, I'm prepared to go even deeper into the Omo Valley. This place is wild. I feel like I've just stepped into another planet. Today's 20,000 strong Hummer community carries on the traditions of their ancestors. Traditions that go back centuries. What is the purpose of putting the clay in your hair? From the earth minerals they use to braid their hair, to local health remedies you won't find at any Walgreens. This young girl is about to stick her face inside of the stomach. 
next, I'm on a mission to survive a day with the Hummer tribe. How long does it take to walk here? I want to see how they live. How many wives do you have? But even more. Oh, wow. How they eat. Put, put. I know, it just looks like it cooked halfway. That's all. It all starts with the Hummer's typical daily breakfast. Good morning. How do you say it? This morning, I'm sharing a meal with the village Nagaya. chief, Geita. Oh, can I shake your hand? His wife, Girma, and our Hummer guide, Oita. Oita, how far away from here did you grow up? Nine kilometers. Oita is a Hummer villager turned tour guide. Today, he'll help me get more insight. What is the correct way to eat this? Into what it means to live in the Hummer tribe. I can show you. Please. Or, or maybe he shot. Okay. Every morning, people here cook up a humble but hearty meal consisting of two components, fresh cow milk and balesha. Balesha is a type of bread made of wheat flour, turned into a dough, then cooked into bread on a hot clay flat top with plenty of glistening cooking oil. So he's putting milk inside the calabash. He's got some of this wheat bread, and then he washes it down with some milk, and then we all share. Fantastic. Mm. Mm. Nice bread, just a dense flat bread like a pancake. It's a little bit smoky from the calabash. It's the first time I've had smoked milk. Yeah. So this is the way they eat breakfast. Yes. When you milk the cow, how long does the milk stay good for? You drink. Just drink, okay. What do you think of breakfast today? Yes, good. All right, probably same as every day. <laughs> In the southwestern expanse of Ethiopia, you'll find over 50,000 members of the Hamer tribe. They work as pastoralists, relying on herding as their primary source of livelihood. Their precious pastures are built in the center of their homes in order to more easily protect their livestock from predators. Their clothes are made of leather. Their diet consists mainly of meat, and they have their own language. What do you think sets the Hamer apart from other tribes in Ethiopia? We have a different ritual for pool jumping, for getting for wife. Let's see if I have this correct. You have to jump over a bull, over a bull. in order to get a wife. Yes. That's pretty different. The bull jumping ceremony is the bridge to becoming a man. Young men confront their fears head on as they jump over a row of angry, testosterone filled bulls. How many wives do you have? One way. For you, is it really important to women here that a man can jump over several bulls? They don't care. Yeah. But I mean, we have enemy, by the way. So he uh, killed someone from the other tribe. She proud of him. Has he killed people? No. Oh. So it turns out, for the men, it's very important to jump over the bulls. Well, yeah, yeah. For the women, they don't care that much. But it would be nice if you've killed somebody. Yeah. Well, today we're going to be killing something. It's not a person, but it is a goat. Soon, I'll join the tribe as they slaughter a goat and transform it into some bizarre dishes. Dishes I've never seen before. You know, just with the number of things I've eaten around the world, you think it just wouldn't be an issue anymore. Cheers. To begin, the sacrifice of one goat. This is a really special day because I'm told you're not able to eat goat every day or very often at all. How often do people here eat meat or eat their own cattle? It's a little rare. Every day we drink milk, but the meat, uh, my wife is born and then she has money blood out here. Yeah? So that time we kill. Sometimes uh, goat die, we will eat that one. Right, I would be so bad at being a villager. I just, every other day I would accidentally kill a goat. In just a moment, the goat behind me is gonna be slaughtered. Immediately after the slaughter, they collect the blood and the blood is drank raw. A swift stab to the heart. This is how the Halmer people ensure a rapid and efficient end for the animal. The blood finds its home in a calabash. As soon as the draining is complete, the raw goat blood is shared among the villagers. Just like the milk, everybody shares, everybody takes a turn. Ah, oh, can I tell you something? I ate a hearty breakfast and I'm glad I did because I recommend never to drink warm, raw goat's blood on an empty stomach. You never get used to this. Uh, you know, with that smoky calabash, it adds another layer of flavor to the flavor profile. I mean, I hate to profile. It's just like very metallic irony. I guess the most disconcerting part is that it's still warm from the goat's body. Oh yeah, it seems so satisfying. It's like chicken noodle soup. When you're out here, every precious calorie matters. What even is this? 
and blood is a valuable source of nutrients, including vitamins and minerals. Sorry, blood burp. In the past, this was a very common addition to their diet, but these days, due to economics, slaughters are happening less and less. My body still feels like this is pretty unusual. For them, this is a treat. This is something that comes around maybe two or three months. You can see it's not everybody in the village joined together doing this. It's a select few people who get to have a taste. After a few rounds of sip, sip, pass, the remaining blood is set aside for an upcoming dish. Now, we're finally allowed to begin the next step. The skin is carefully removed. Later, it'll be transformed into clothing or leather products to sell. Now, they're doing something I've never seen before. As they sever the animal's bowels, they remove the goat's stomach with its contents still intact. This is presented to a younger sister. This young girl is about to stick her face inside of the stomach and take a deep breath. I was told moments ago this girl was feeling sick, she has a stomach ache, she has a headache, and they said the remedy, the cure, is to take the stomach, cut it open, and immediately have her breathe the contents of the stomach, and that is what just happened. After that, she took off. With the aromatherapy complete, the goat's organs are now collected. Liver, kidneys, tripe. These will not be saved for later, as folks here prefer to eat the organs raw. The first thing he does is he cuts a piece of the raw stomach, and then he eats it. At this point, the name of the game is, oh geez, thanks. Just slice off some random pieces of organs and eat it raw. Oh, it smells really bad. And that stomach is barely clean. I'm sorry, it's still like gastric juices on there. pretending to eat it. <laughs> All right, here I go. Oh, you know what? It tastes like granola bars. Just kidding. It doesn't. Liver is much more soft. Stomach is very chewy and absolutely still full of stomach acid. But no salt and no lime to chase it. Oof, da. Wow. Right now they're cutting the kidney. Kidney always has that mineral type flavor to it, like mineral water. No, it's nothing like that. With our appetizer complete, the butchering continues. Each part of the goat is reserved for a different dish. Portions will be used for soup and some for barbecue. Almost nothing will go to waste except for the bile sack, which is fine with me because Ooh. I don't like it either. Yeah, looks like that's trash. With the goat fully broken down, it's time to cook. Big chunks of meat are skewered and staked into the ground nearby where a fire will soon be built. Among our soon to be roasted proteins, the goat head and another highly prized body part. Across the village, the women break down sections of meat into even smaller pieces, preparing for a soup that will include a hint of blood. While cooking is underway, I'm following Miss Girma to a local Hammer market to buy some essential ingredients. Ingredients that can't be found around the village. On special designated days, the surrounding Hammer tribes and people make their way to this market. Some drive, some ride, and others, like Girma, must travel the old-fashioned way, walking several hours until she finally reaches her destination. Welcome to Damaka Market. This is a market that comes about twice a week. Every Tuesday and Saturday, people from around the area, all from the Hammer tribe, bring their wares here. Every product here is tailored to local tastes and needs. Of course, you'll find vegetables, dried goods, plenty of livestock, both big and small. There's honey and clay pots or pans used for cooking. Some ingredients you wouldn't even recognize. Like these, not coffee beans, but coffee shells. I'll find out what they're used for soon. So this is a traditional Hammer chair. Oh, not bad. It's like a saddle, it's kind of comfortable. I think if I move the wrong way, it'll go inside of me. <laughs> When people gather, especially after a long walk, they can find respite in the shade, noshing on simple local foods and blowing off steam with some local booze. I noticed that not a ton of eating, but a lot of drinking happening here. Is it kind of like a party when people come here? Most of the time, the people, they want to enjoy the alcohol. They use for relaxing. I've used it for that reason once before. It was very effective. Welcome to the Hummer Pub. On the menu, beer, but this is no lager. This is sorghum beer. How many people have put their lips on here? In our culture, we don't use at one. Like, sure. we can share. So a lot. <laughs> Cheers. Our market expert, Oida's friend, Mr. Chuna. Ooh, sour. You want some? It's okay. It's thick, sour, it tastes a little muddy, very earthy. After shopping, Girma routinely comes here for a little bit of me time. There you go. Good? <laughs> That's the first time I've seen her smile all day. And she's doing it behind the bucket. The camera cannot see, but... <laughs> we found what makes her happy. How many buckets do you need to drink in order to get drunk? 
<laughs> Maybe two, three. Two or three buckets? <laughs> You're gonna triple your body weight. <laughs> When you come to this market, how long does it take to walk here? They spend the night in the, in the, in the way and they reach in the morning. My gosh, I mean, it took about 40 minutes by car, but that's pretty intense. On occasion, Guillermo will sell a goat at this market, then use that money to buy necessities like honey, butter, corn, salt, or coffee shells. What do you do with the coffee shells? They use like a coffee for energy. Just for energy. To get off hungry, they use the coffee most of the time. So they use it like a stimulant. It gives them energy, but also reduces their hunger. As iconic as coffee is in Ethiopia, not everyone can afford it. But boiling the very affordable coffee shells is a cheap way to experience a quick caffeine high. Soon, I'll try this shell coffee for myself. But first, snacks. This looks like it's been boiled. Is it just boiled corn? Yes. Mm, it's about what you would think. It's just salty, very large kernel, rubbery corn. I would say this is like the drinking food of this area. It's a delicious, yeah? It's corn. You can't go wrong with corn. As a digestive. Ooh, it smells very sour. A sip of wine made from honey. Mm. Maybe I come every uh, Saturday here. Yeah, yeah, it seems like a party, man. It's sweet, it's smooth. You can taste that it's fermented, of course, kind of sour, but it has a nice taste. Occasionally, can she put the bucket down so we can see her face? <laughs> it's good? Cool. What do you got there? It's tobacco. Tobacco? This lady, <laughs> she has a tobacco necklace. She's putting some tobacco in her hand. She sniffed the tobacco and that's going to give her a little bit of a buzz. She meets with a friend. Oh, it's her friend? Yeah, they know each other. I mean, why not? She's drinking, she's smoking through her nose, and then now she's hanging out with her friends. It's a party. Where am I? I just feel like I'm on another planet. I love it. Good stuff? With our market mission complete, we're heading back to the village to finish up cooking for today's big feast. While those big chunks of barbecue are still grilling, another dish is taking form. This dish is made with the meat scraps not big enough to barbecue, but it also includes every other piece they could find. The organs, the mouth, the tail, even the blood, which they pour into intestines before sewing it shut. Put all the ingredients inside a cooking vessel filled with water and let it simmer for a couple hours. While that cooks, I've spotted two Hummer women taking part in a beauty custom completely foreign to me. How's your hair appointment going? Good. How often are you having to kind of redo or refresh your hair? If I have butter, I do every two weeks. You absolutely need butter and red clay, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Can I ask something? Do you own a mirror? I don't have. How do you know if your hair looks the way you want it to look? My friend is telling me, you have a good hair. Why is it that some women in the village have the kind of clay-treated hair as you do and some don't? Before Mary, she do whatever she <laughs> went. After Mary, she clay. Oh, so all the women with the clay in their hair, the reason is because they're married. Yes. When she's married, chef is forbidden. So always they put it in the clay. Jewelry also makes the Hummer people stand out. It can be made from clay, beads, or even metal. The more ornate, the more the jewelry suggests you're a person of wealth and status. What is the purpose of the necklace that you're wearing? The first wife, she have that on her neck. The first wife? Yeah. Does your husband have more than one wife? Yes. Is it better to be the first wife or the second wife? The first wife. Okay. How did your husband sell you on the idea of a second wife? I also have a first wife. Yes. My only wife. Y you need a second wife? I don't need, but... but. Oh. <laughs> All right, I think my wife heard that. Thank you for the interview. I got to get going. After a long, well-done roast, the meat is fully grilled. Soon, this will be shared among the villagers. But there are two special parts that won't make it to the final meal. The goat's testicles and the goat's head. This is going to be our first taste of the goat, but that's actually been cooked. The head and the testicles skewered by the fire. But before we get to that, we have this right here. This is the coffee. This one-of-a-kind coffee is made by boiling coffee shells with water. The Hummer drink it in the morning to fuel up before work begins. God, it almost doesn't taste like coffee at all. It's probably what you would expect. It does taste like they've been boiling shells and not beans. There's no coffee aroma. It's not a bad taste, but it tastes almost more like a tea, like it has a wooden flavor. And do you think this gives them energy? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Really? Wow. Next to that, we have these. Oh, is this the scrotum? Yeah, cover of the testicle. The scrotum. And then this main part of the testicle yeah. is a female eat. Only the women? Yes. Why is that? I'm gonna get, I'm gonna... So we are men, so we don't eat it. We don't eat it. 
we already have testicles. <laughs> so he's carefully peeling the inner layer of the scrotum. The remaining product is right here. It's a big, beautiful nut case. Cheers. Mm. Ah. Not bad. Very fatty, a bit smoky, difficult to chew through. You like it? I like it. Yeah, <laughs> nice work, bro. So he's cutting off a piece of the brain right here, and he's gonna go for it. Yeah, please. Ooh, that was a big piece. Yikes. Oh, oh yeah. Enjoy it. Oh, this is, I heard this is how you avoid dementia. Eat, 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 eat. Oh, wow. It, put, put. I know, it just looks like it cooked halfway. That's all. I'm taking half a bite. This is a big old clump of brains. Mmm. Yeah, it's creamy, buttery. It tastes like liver a little bit. Yeah, it's good stuff. You want mine? I want to be selfish. Yeah. He loves it. Hey, gentlemen, thank you so much. That was, I mean, as far as sacks and brains go, top notch. To finish it off, the goat soup needs another ingredient to be complete. A dough is made out of wheat flour, formed into oblong shapes, and tossed inside the soup pot to cook for a few minutes. Once finished, the food is divided into separate containers. The meat, the dough, and the soup. Time to eat. This meal looks amazing. A one-of-a-kind opportunity, a one-of-a-kind meal. It looks great. Cut <laughs> Wow, you translate so quickly. <laughs> so how do we eat it? <laughs> the Chiefs family joins us for this final meal, including Girma and their son and daughter. We ate meat with bread and then we drink soup. He just pulled off a chunk of lung, takes a bite, eats a little bit of the dumpling. Very nice. Oh, he's going to put the dumpling back. Ah, bold move. Right here we have the lung. Now, they've really shrunk down quite a bit. Either that or this goat was a smoker. Ooh, wow. And I'm going to rip that in half because it's a bit big. Not bad. I gotta say, the lungs are pretty good. A little bit of dumpling. Yeah. Sticky, dense, doughy. As countries like Ethiopia develop, and as the battle for grazing lands becomes more fierce, government programs have been put into place to ensure tribes like these have enough food to survive. Most commonly, they're delivered bags of grain flour, like that which we had for breakfast. I'm curious, how long has the government been helping by giving them flour? It's a very long time, but I don't know how old. When you were young, did you also pair it with bread or some kind of a dumpling like this? No. When we were young, we moved with animals. Were the Homer people nomadic in the past? Yes, they eat barbecue only and then drink milk. Here, this is a permanent place. We eat this. So back then, it was just meat and milk. Yes. I've got the goat tail. It's been braised. It's so soft, I can just peel the meat right off the tail like that. So it's so tender, it's fatty. The tail is delicious. Yeah? Really good. Oh, hmm. a little bit of oiliness, a little smoky from the calabash. That's an interesting flavor. Satisfying. So it sounds like for about as long as he can remember, the government has been supporting the people here. My big question is, if you go back 100 years, were people of this tribe doing better 100 years ago, or are they doing better now? For me, question. Yes. Uh, 100 years ago. And so how does that happen? With their pals, they get enough rain, they get enough harvesting, like a your life. But now, more drought. Maybe in a year, two or three times rain. Always is like drought. Uh, animals die. If you could change anything to improve the life of your people here, if you were God, if you were magic, what would you change? <laughs> Just leave it how it is. Why is that? Just begging government. No way. I... They need help. Well, listen, I want to say thank you so much for allowing us to come in, letting us roam around your village and sit down with you and eat with you. This has been an interesting, insightful day. So thank you so much. As our Ethiopian journey continues, we're delving even deeper into this country's Omo Valley to a place with some of the harshest conditions I've witnessed in Africa. A place where children sleep outside among the scorpions and spiders. This is already very different from the other tribes we visited here in Ethiopia. The living conditions, it's much more dire, it's much more desperate. In spite of the adversity they face, there is a special treat. The Dasanaj have a diet unlike anywhere else. From here, you take some of the broth and you dump that into the blood. Whether they're going to the Omo River to spar with giant black crocodiles. Can I be honest? I'm a little bit afraid. Or whether they're consuming a pile of this miracle plant. They have a medicines when you have a malaria. Folks here always find a way. 
Next, I'm on a mission to hunt and eat as a Dasanash tribal member as I attempt to keep up with Africa's toughest tribe. The sun has been down for one hour. We are on the water, but we've not left the shore. Right now, it's chaos on the beach. You can't see it, but there's about 100 people watching us. They said they need to wait for the waves to calm down. A day with the toughest tribe in Africa should not start with a meal, but with a hunt. And we're not hunting down just any animal. We've got our sights on a giant, black, river-dwelling crocodile. Pleasure to meet you. I hear you are the great hunter. Yes. Tonight, we said we wanted to join you as you went on a crocodile hunt. You told us the chances of you getting a crocodile is 100%. I love the confidence, but let's talk about the process. As you go down the river, what are you looking for and how do you actually capture the crocodile. The captains to get with the boat and I'm ready to hunting. With a spear? With a spear. Sir, we're about to go out on the boats. Please be honest. Are you afraid? He's not afraid. Not afraid at all. Say I'm ready. Sir, let's do this. We don't have guns. We don't have harpoons. Instead, our hunters leave a weapon of choice is a spear. Jab the spear through the croc, let it drag you around the water until it's exhausted, then chuck it in the boat. Sounds easy enough, though if you capsize, there's always the chance of being eaten alive. We follow close behind in a separate boat, though we've been instructed to make no sounds and produce no light. Not ideal for a video. All right, so after a couple riveting hours of crocodile hunting, we have Nothing. Sadly, our hunter has come up short. The village will not be dining on crocodile tomorrow. But nonetheless, we will still put on a feast. Very good, quite juicy. And I'll come face to face with some of the toughest warriors on this continent. The Dasanash tribe, their name means people of the Delta, a farming and cattle raising society numbering about 60,000. With the rising sun, they begin a new day. Some start by making food. Others tend to livestock. Some work the fields, and many socialize, shooting the shit to pass the time. Meanwhile, a very Dasanaj breakfast is being prepared. Dining with me, Mr. Tomrat, our hunter, and Bray, our local producer. I was hoping to see somebody hunt a crocodile for real in the river. We don't get to do that, but someone hunted these fish. Was that you? That us, Him and also the others together. This dish starts with fresh fish, now being cut down to manageable portions. So we hunt different fishes like tilapia, catfish. And all those are right here? Yes. Heat up a pot of water, then fill it up with chunks of fish. The Dasanash people rely on the nearby Omo Valley River for their livelihood. Besides its significance in agriculture, transportation, and social gatherings, the river also serves as a vital source of fresh food. Fish like these are a key component to their diet. These are big chunks. Oh, I got a skin bite right here. And we mix that with the porridge? Yeah, we first eat the fish, and then after that, the porridge. Mm. Porridge, the staple carbohydrate of the Dasanach. It's a mixture of water, salt, maize flour, and sorghum, stirred until it becomes thick. Hmm. The fish are a little bit rare. It's like sushi, a little jelly-like in the middle. How is it? It's appetite. It's very tasty. The skin is nice, it's gummy and fat. The very inside is very tender. It's a little bit mushy and it tastes a lot like river fish, so it has some minerality to it. They have this right here. This is just like a fish broth. Ooh, it smells, that smells really fishy. Hmm, I thought it would have more flavor. It's really fatty. It's like a thick film of fish fat on top. He said, I love it. You love it? Did you grow up in this area? I live my local life in this area. The people here, what are they eating mostly? So they grow corn, maize, and then they eat porridge and fish. That's like kind of the staple here. Do people here get enough food? People live nearby to the river. They can get food easily because they eat fish. But people a little bit further from the river, they don't have that much. What would be really special for people here to be able to eat? In general, with a different variety of stews. How often do they get to try that? 
yeah, yeah. They eat like once in a week or twice in a week. The stew has more flavor than the porridge. What about meat? So many people here have cattle or livestock, they have cows, they have sheep, they have goats. Are people in a community like this able to experience that very often? They eat meat, but not every day, like for different occasions, holidays. When someone slaughters a goat or a sheep or a cow, he calls neighbors to come and to join and to eat. I feel a little bit bad because I was hoping that, you know, we would get a giant crocodile and then the whole village would rejoice and we would share it and eat it together. Can you think of a good crocodile replacement? We can eat sheep. Sheep. Ah, it's pretty much the same, right? Crocodile, sheep, close enough. I'm gonna jump on the phone. I have a guy. I'm gonna see what we can do about getting a sheep. So our breakfast has ended and we've shared the fish with everyone here, but there's a way of sharing it. First, it's given to the elders. The portion that's saved for the children just gets mixed into one big blue tub. And then they just say go and the kids go for it. It's not really organized. People who are a little bit more aggressive get more and people who are a little bit more hesitant or passive get less. Life here feels harsh with poverty evident in the local diet and living conditions. Married couples live in houses made of sticks and metal scraps, while the rest sleep outside on the ground, amidst the dangers posed by animals like snakes and scorpions. Through my own lens, I don't see much more than suffering and hardship. Yet the faces of the people here tell a different story, and we'll soon find out why their own lens is a powerful one. I could not possibly imagine sleeping outside on the ground. How do you manage to do that? But first, I'm sitting down with two joint village chiefs and translator Mercy to get a taste of what's known here as the miracle plant. What are the benefits of this plant? They have medicines. When you have a malaria, insulin, and also blood pressures. The miracle plant, or moringa, is locally farmed, provided for the Dasanach tribe by the Ethiopian government. It's known as the miracle plant because every part of the moringa tree can benefit humans and animals. The leaves, roots, bark, seeds, and seed cake can be used as food, medicine, and even for water purification. Today, our focus is on the leaves, boiled simply with salt. Once complete, the broth is separated from the leaves. It tastes pretty good. It tastes kind of like a boiled spinach, but a little bit less mushy, a little bit more tough, and a slightly bitter taste to it too. Overall, it tastes good. It tastes a little bit like okra. I might like that more than the fish. And then the other way to consume is by drinking the liquid. Ooh. I'm tasting a little bit of the history of this calabash. <laughs> it tastes like vegetables, but then I can smell like goat or sheep or something in there too. It's certainly not stainless steel Tupperware. You're both the village elders. You're the oldest people here. Do you both come from right around this area? Yes. If there's one more food they could add to what they have here to make their life more comfortable or enjoyable, what would they add? Camel milk and the camel meats. So they have not here. The camels, the camel from or South Sudan or the Kenyan, like Turkanas. If you gave me a hundred guesses, I would not have guessed camel meat and camel milk. The options for food here, how has that changed from the time they were children until now? Are there more food options, fewer food options? They have a difference of foods. More options now than when they were children? Yes. And so is life easier now? When at this time it's good for fooding, for her life, all. With the arrival of the sheep, it's time to start our grand feast. After slaughtering, the blood is drained and saved, soon to be transformed into a comforting afternoon soup. The skin is removed and the meat is broken down and butchered. The cooking technique employed here is an ancient one. The sheep chunks are pierced with a sharpened tree branch and placed near the fire for roasting. While we wait for this to cook, our first sheep dish is taking form. So before the meal begins, I'm told that there is a special treat. Here is the recipe for Dasanach blood soup. First, boil sheep bones, meat, and organs together to make a sort of sheep stock. That sheep stock joins the blood, creating a signature combination, unlike any tribe I've seen so far. Is that it? Yes. I was hoping that the blood would turn brown or look cooked or something. Wow. 
he just took a massive sip like a fat guy who just ran his first 5K in the Sahara Desert. So what was the purpose of adding the broth? It's good for bone. Ah, it's very sheepy, it's super gamey. Ooh! He <laughs> said, I like to so much. I'm happy for him. Now, back to the sheet meat. With enough time by the crackling fire, the meat is perfectly grilled and ready for feasting. Joining us, the sheep experts themselves, Mr. Lakorluk and Mr. Arai Karech, representing the young generation of the Dasanach tribe. Gentlemen, nice barbecue skills. Before we get into this, I want to ask you some questions about your village here. Last night we were hunting with the brave crocodile killer and as we were walking back to our vehicle we saw all kinds of different animals on the ground. Have you ever been bit or stung by something dangerous outside when you were sleeping? Yeah, well, I'm from London. Sometimes that, not that much. Have you ever been stung by a scorpion? Yes, one time. What do you do in that situation? They have like uh, elders. They are well known by traditional medicine, and then we use that. Did that work? But I'm tefeto is in this era. Definitely works. Another thing that can make you feel better. This is the backlight. This is like kind of the Maasai style of consumption. Usually there would be a large group of people eating together and one person cutting and distributing the meat to everybody else. It looks very good, quite juicy. Mmm. That's all you need. Protein, fire, it has a very sheepy flavor, but overall it tastes quite delicious. A little smoky, a little sour. The ribs look the best. They're very tiny, thin, but the meat looks crispy. There's a nice layer of fat on there. Mmm. The ribs are by far the best. Super tender, fatty, soft, like a crispy layer on the outside. I'm gonna try this on the 4th of July sometime. Do you know how old you are? I'm 25. What is your job right now? He's like a shepherd. What are the options available to folks around here? What opportunities are there? The better option now for that Dasanich people is the farm because the Omo River. As somebody who's 25, what is your idea of success? When we start like a new job, maybe farming, we call it success. You know, I gotta say, for most Americans watching this right now, they're saying, I could not possibly imagine sleeping outside on the ground, in the dirt, in the elements, with all the sounds, with all the bugs, with the f***ing roosters. How do you manage to do that? Our fathers, grandfathers are doing this for many years. So for us, it's easy to live like this. He's saying his adaptation. I think that's a really important takeaway because I think a lot of people may look at other cultures and they see they don't live in the same way and their default emotion is to feel sorry for them when he doesn't feel bad he doesn't pity himself this is his everyday life for you like I mean what would you say if you're speaking to an American who he has to go to sleep at the same time every night he has to have a very soft bed earplugs the perfect temperature he needs it to me he needs all these things in order to sleep what would you say to this person and, and then, yeah, back, and then, yeah, back. he says it's easy we'll teach him if all these things that uh, most Western would perceive as being difficult, seem like everyday life to you, then what is actually difficult for you? We don't have any fear of enemies, are people from around the Turkana. So that's our challenge and that's our enemies. So, life is good? It's very good. Amazing. Next, you'll witness a day in the life of Ethiopia's iconic Mercy tribe. The Mercy people stand apart from any other tribe in this country. They're known most for their iconic lip plates, worn by the tribe's women. I want to learn how they make this incredible transformation and why they do it. Do either of you remember the stretching process? Was it painful? Along the way, we'll discover the typical and not so typical diet of the Mercy people, which can range from the bland. I keep seeing people spit out stuff. And I think it's just right here. To the bafflingly bizarre. That's the stomach, but it's still full of... Yeah, yes, but for them, it's okay. It all starts with this. Good morning. Before our arrival this morning, our Mercy host was in full-on prep mode for our welcome meal. It is an absolute honor and privilege to be here today. This is a moment I've been dreaming of for a long time. The Mercy women gathered sorghum from the fields and freed the seeds from their stems by simply stomping on them. The Mercy people, they're people I've seen in magazines, National Geographic when I was young, and I've always wanted to come here for myself, and now 
I'm finally here. Then comes the ancient grind, pounding those grains into powder with rocks. Soon, this sorghum flour will be mixed into a Mercy Classic. There are many unique traits, characteristics of the Mercy tribe, but there's obviously one that stands out the most, which is the iconic lip plate that the women have. Um, I have so many questions about it. Okay, First, just practically, do either of you remember the stretching process? Was it painful? It's been painful. The long and painful lip stretching process begins at the tender age of seven, when Mercy girls have their bottom two teeth removed and their lower lip pierced. And now, is there any sensation? Is there any pain, or is it just normal? No problem. By the time they turn 18, their lip stretching transformation is finally complete, progressing from a finger sized wooden peg through a lip incision to proudly displaying a four to seven inch plate made of wood or clay. Having the lip plate, how did it change your life? When they eat, when they do hard jobs, and when they sleep, it's very heavy, especially the big ones, not comfortable to do, to eat, to sleep, they may just take it off. So I guess the thing that I wonder, and I think most people watching will be wondering, is why do people do this? It seems painful, it creates a body transformation that lasts a lifetime, you can never go back from this. What is the purpose in doing so? They do the lip plates for two purposes. The first one, if the girl have a big plate, she's blessed from the God and she's ready for a marriage. So marriage cannot begin until they have the full size yes. plate, is that correct? Yeah. And the second one, to be attractive for the young man. The big plate, symbolical meanings like she's most rich family girl and the more big one is the more beautiful. So this is something that men here or find beautiful. Mm -hmm. You have a very big plate. Do you feel beautiful? Look at this, she said. When I take it off, I'm not beautiful like this. I look little ugly. I feel more beauty when I do the lip plate like this. Soon, I'll ask a young girl from this village if she plans to carry on the same tradition. 100 years from now, far into the future, will we see anybody with these lip plates or will the tradition just go away completely? Her answer is shocking. But first, the food. The freshly ground sorghum flour is tossed in a boiling pot of water and stirred continuously. The same treatment goes for some local spinach, picked freshly this morning, just steps away from where we sit now. After becoming thick and clumpy, the sorghum is ready, but the spinach isn't finished until it's doused in oil and salt. Of course, when they eat, the plate comes out. Yes, of right? course. So, we grab a piece of porridge. Yeah, yeah. Just follow them. Mm -hmm. Toss that back, grab some veggies, toss that in too. Mmm, the vegetables are good, but very oily. Very tasty one. They just want to make more oil to have a good taste. It's kind of like fried spinach, but if it was in a pool of oil. Before, they don't know the oil one, they use only the plant. Nowadays, they know that there is a salt and oil from the city. They come by, when they taste, it's more tasty from the natural. And more calories too. Yes, of course. The Mercy are a semi-nomadic tribe of 10,000, residing in Ethiopia's famous Omo Valley. Despite being pastoralists, their cattle are reserved for trading in a nearby town, while their daily diet consists only of what we have here. It really surprises me that they're eating this for almost every meal. I see they eat corn, they eat a couple different types of porridge, and then they're eating these vegetables right here. Of course. Knowing this, we came here today and we brought a cow. With my bovine offering, the village will gather for a rare feast packed with protein. At the same time, I'll participate in some of the world's most bizarre customs, from consuming unclean raw organs. Don't wipe all that shit off, that's the flavor. To witnessing a fortune teller whose crystal ball comes in the form of a cow gut. Oh, all right, Rudy. it's all about you. No. How often are they usually getting the chance to eat a cow? Once a year if there is a holiday. Killing the cow, butchering the cow, how do they remember if they're doing it so seldomly? The big healers will teach them, which generates from generations. Another tribe, another method of dispatching the animal. This one is a first for me. The blood here is valued as it is among many tribes across Africa, but the way they procure the blood is a little bit different. They find the jugular, they leak it out into a bowl, and then this man right here just chugged a whole big bowl of blood. When a cow is slaughtered for special events, the honor of drinking its fresh blood is granted to the person who takes its life, often a young warrior of the tribe. Now, I would also try the blood, except for that I've tried it here in almost every video in Ethiopia so far, so.
you get the idea. My long trip in Ethiopia has already included a taste of raw, warm goat's blood with the Hammer tribe. Quite the flavor profile. And a taste of raw beef kidneys with the Dorze. I would literally eat anything right now to help with that taste. Here, the raw eating experience reaches a new extreme. That's the stomach, but yeah. it's still full of Yeah, Yes, but for them it's okay. They just want to eat the raw one like this. Let's do it. First, we wet our appetite with some raw liver. Thank you. Wow, that's fantastic. When you are here with the tribe, whatever they eat, whatever they drink, you have to test, you know. Brother, that is my whole life. You have to try to. Cheers. Mm, I should pretty clean liver. More healthy and clean. Every part of the body is very healthy. So we are eating the raw one. No problem will happen with us, as well as with tribe. Mm. Oh, God, that was a big one. Oh, hold on, I'm still chewing. He's trying to give you another one. Aside from just thinking about myself, my favorite part of this experience is seeing how much everybody enjoys it. They cut it, they share it, they take a bite. They're really savoring the moment. And then here's the stomach. The stomach, yeah. He just goes for it, huh? You can see the grass and the stomach acid, the bile, the future shit. You can try like that. You'll try too? Yeah. <laughs> if I'm going down, someone's going down with me. It like stomach acid. Do not smell before eating. Cheers. Cheers. I will see it's very soft, but yeah. not tasty like the liver one. Yeah. Somehow it's not that bad. I actually enjoy the texture. It's kind of crunchy almost. It tastes like how a barn smells. So when people are like, oh, it tastes like shit. How do you know what shit tastes like? Have you tasted shit right now? Yes. It's not just the cow's organs that are impressively eaten raw, but every part of the cow has a purpose. So even the cow's waste will not go to waste. Moments ago, when they took out the stomach, I saw a young man take out some of the contents, and then he gave himself a ritual rub down. Of course. For Mercy Men, this unusual form of body painting is a way of flexing their abilities in herding and domestic nighttime activities. 80% of their life built on their cows, so he just may put some piece of fish on his body to just be blessed from the God. That's beautiful. Yeah, so beautiful. Do you want to try that too? Me, no. I'm Why not? You just said it's beautiful. <laughs> just when I thought I'd seen it all, these guys start predicting the future based on a map created by the cow's intestines. So uh, when they're reading the stomach, it's like represents like a village. Bella, she grew it up. All right. After two months from now, from all Mursi people, mm. it tells them somebody will be sick. What do we do with this information? My wanderings through Africa have taught me that tribal wisdom runs deep when it comes to remedies from nature. It's good even for malaria and it heals. Had to prove it. Can you heal a broken heart? So I'm eager to find out which healing secrets the mercy have to show me. When we see some person will be get sick, we'll take him to the hospital. No problem. Okay. Can they tell me anything about myself? On your future, you are here. There is one women in front of your life you will marry her but i'm like currently married she's in the shade right now my wife is it my wife there is another wife second wife Ooh. i just feel like my wife's gonna be mad at me it's like babe I, it's cow guts what can i do what should i do it's cow guts i'm sorry after the organs it's time for the meat the men barbecue the beef using a wood fire pit, placing the meat directly on top of the cinders. While the women cook more intricate dishes, like stewed meat and blood cooked with vertebrae. While the main courses are taking shape, Sergio introduces me to an unexpected snack. Of course, we know you can eat the sorghum seed and you can crush it, you can make flour, but this is actually right here. This is the sorghum stock, right? Yes. Guided by two Mercy women, we're in the sorghum field now. So when you go to the other villagers, they just eat the sorghum seeds as a powder and make it a porridge, but the steam like a sugar cane. It's very tasty for them. Oh, can we try it? Mm. You're right. It's something between grass and sugar cane. So it's a fun little snack. You chew, you swallow the saliva and throw the rest of the other. Around the village, I keep seeing like... <laughs> like a confetti of celery. And I think it's just right here. Sorry, did I get you? Oh, that's good. 
She's got one chunk. Very efficient. To the Mercy people, sorghum fields are a precious treasure, providing their tribe with vital calories. This field looks like a hurricane came through here. What happened? They grow already last two, three months ago. This is a time to harvest. After the harvest, they leave the sorghum to dry in the field for two weeks. But in the meantime, they must keep an eye out for village food thieves. So how big of a problem are the birds? A lot of, like a group of birds will come and collect the seeds. If they are not here, they will disappear it within two, three days. To keep the sorghum thief at bay, the Mercy people construct wooden fortresses like this. With a young soldier stationed high above, armed with a simple but effective tool to hurl rocks at the annoying birds. When it comes to planting crops, taking care of them, is that the job of men or women? Growing, harvesting crops, taking of children, building house are more responsibility of Mercy women. Men protect the family from other tribes. All the day you can say they are staying, sleeping under the shed. Except yeah, if they fight, they might die. So when they die, they can be free from everything. Wow, that got yeah. dark real fast. So are the Mercy men fierce defenders or merely masters of napping? I plan to ask the chief himself over a pile of freshly roasted meats. With all the cooking complete, the entire village gathers to enjoy the fruit of their labor. The men have roasted this. Yeah. And the roasting method is they don't put it on a stick, they don't put it on a grate, they just put it right on the charcoal. The only time I've seen people put the meat directly on the charcoal was with the Hidzabe tribe. What's this one right here? A big meat from the size of the bill, the right legs of the cow. So he's cutting it just like he cut that raw liver. Oh, it's looking juicy. This is the best thing about meat. You can just put it over charcoal. You don't need any technique, any seasonings. It just looks so desirable. Already, you can't do that with kale. Cheers. Yeah. Little chewy though. No seasonings, no salt. You can taste the essence of the cow. It's beefy. Is there a certain part that you like the most when you're eating this? You know, humps here. Behind the neck? Behind the neck. And right and left legs of the cow. Can I tell you my favorite part? The beef ribs. Oh, I mean, take a look at that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's a big rib. You can try like me. Oh. I know. It works. It's uh, a little bit tough, slightly chewy, but otherwise it has a nice ratio of fat and protein. It gives us some real nice flavor. So you are the chief of this village. How many people are you presiding over? Yes, He is a chief more than 5,000 people. Really? Yeah. How many children do you have? From three wives. You hey. can have 10 children now. That's quite the shopping list for Christmas. In this tribe, the men and women have very defined roles. One of the responsibilities of men here is to protect the tribe. Who are you protecting this tribe from? They protect the community from upper sides of the mountain here, Mago, because of the grazing land, they fight each other sometimes. In the untamed expanse of the Omo Valley, disputes over territory or grazing lands are settled the old fashioned way. The enemy of the mercy the Hammer, a tribe we just sat down with a couple days ago. When is the last time there was a conflict with that tribe? Last two months before. They came to their village and they took uh, like hundreds of cows from them. And that was the main reason for the conflict. Yeah, six people passed away. Two from the Mursi, four from Ari. This is still a, a fresh reconciliation. Yeah. How do you feel about that other tribe? Very nice. Quiet and safe now. The elders became negotiate each other and the government reconciliate. Finally, they, pro they solved the problem. I guess quick to violence, quick to forgiveness is what it sounds like. As a way to display their valor and triumph, the Mercy Men craft stunning scarifications by carving their flesh after each achievement. Kind of like a Boy Scout merit badge, but a little more permanent. The scarf here, as we said, some of it has symbolical meaning like this. Everyone from the tribe is a killer from another tribe. Wait, so that means that he's killed somebody? The kills, long times ago. Nowadays, killing people is forbidden. Oh, I see. Yes, even if animals, so long times ago, maybe they kill a lion, they do the some bracelet from the ivory of iron and the horn of elephant. Elephant to kill. Ah, yeah, yeah, look, the bracelet made from the, uh, the ivory of uh, elephant. 65, 67. Wow. Fascinating. While the men continue feasting, the women gather separately for their own meal. Here, I'll ask a young Mercy woman if she plans to go through with the lip plate tradition. At a certain age, every woman has the lip plate, and then there's many younger women who don't have it. Why is that? Ladies, this food looks fantastic. Yes. So my understanding is that the men eat separately from the women. Of course. In order to respect each other, kids and mama one place, elders and the younger somewhere. Even the way they cook is different. Here is cooked a lot of oils inside. Interesting. Mm -hmm. 
stewed meat is a dish shared by both women and men. The preparation is straightforward. Cow meat and bones simmer until they reach tender perfection. Looks pretty good actually. This meat is so soft. Check it out. Whoa, it can come off basically just by pulling it. I think I just have a good piece right here. You know, those sinewy pieces right next to the bone. It's a little fatty, it's greasy, it's lean, it's soft. It's delicious. Yeah, very delicious. Alas, our final course. Blood cooked with the lungs and vertebrae. Preparation is all about the boil. First, the lungs jump into the bubbling pool. Next, chunks of meat and vertebrae join in. Finally, a pot full of fresh blood drowns everything in scarlet. Ooh, this is a pretty intense looking stew. And the vertebrae has just been brazened away, but the blood is just caked onto it. Here, let me peel the meat off this vertebrate. Oof, da, that looks gnarly. Yeah. It definitely has a lot of taste to it. It's meaty, lots of fat. You can taste the iron and the blood. There's like a layer of blood around all the meat pieces. So there's also some lung pieces in here. I think that's what I found right here. I get the stomach again. That's a new one for me. Squishy, spongy, chewy, and just coated in this blood. My fingers are coated in it too. It's gnarly, but a lot of flavor and definitely more flavor than just eating porridge. Chale? Achale. Achale. Hey, I got this down. So the women with us right now, there's two. She's about 20, she's the daughter, and this is her mother right here. Yes. I wanna ask you a few more questions about the lip plate. It's such an icon of this tribe. And what I've noticed since I've come here is at a certain age, every woman has the lip plate, and then there's many younger women who don't have it. Why is that? As she's telling me, she's her daughter and she she's 20 now. She get a marriage and she get one baby from her husband. She don't have a lip plate. So they don't want to dominate the new growing girls. If they are just following the cultures of the tribe, they want do otherwise it's not obligatory for them so for her she have an option for her she don't have an option when she was kid. for you are you happy that you don't have the lip plane i don't like it i don't want to do it she said but you still had your ears done you yeah. still did the ear gauges you still have the large kind of extended ear lobes i don't know when it was when i was very kid my mom did it oh so she had no choice with the ear yeah so if she knew yeah. she would never would have had the ears yes. done does it make you sad at all that she's broken the tradition. No. Mm. Mm -hmm. So she feels sad. If the girl have like her, she's very happy. But she didn't do anything because she had her own option to do like this. If you have a daughter in the future, will you give her the same choice? If she have a daughter, she don't want to let her to do the lip play. She want to let the girl like this, normal like this, she said. So 100 years from now, far into the future, will we see anybody with these lip plates? Or will the tradition just go away completely after a couple of generations? Yes, it's completely disappeared. After some generation from now, people will become more modern. Everyone becomes normal like here. Is that good or is that bad? She said it's bad. They lost the culture of her, her grandma and her grandfather. Hmm. If you love Indian food, then you're going to love our new channel, Best Ever Food India. Subscribe now for weekly videos showcasing the most unique street food from around the country. Boom. Guys, that is the last video here in Ethiopia. I hope you enjoyed this long, interesting journey as we traveled from the capital, Addis Ababa, down south through the Omo Valley, visiting some of the most unique tribes, not only in Africa, but in the world. Today, this video was incredibly insightful, learning more about the Mercy people. I've seen them so many times in the past, but today actually getting to sit down and eat with them was really a unique treasure. That is it for this one, guys. Thank you so much for watching. I will see you next time. A peace. All right. Now, one of these is my Airbnb, and I'm trying to figure out which one, because they didn't put house numbers. I think it's in here. They said there'd be a, a lot, like a key or something. Hello? Thanks to Go Further Tours for making our Ethiopian trip possible. Click the link to book your Ethiopian tour with Go Further Tours.